Well, I'm Stuart Crawford. I was born March 2nd, 1922, in the bedroom of my parents' home on Rideau Street in Kingston. Ro the wrong side of Princess Street, of course, but we had a great neighborhood, and I was very fortunate in my parents. Went to a public school around the corner, Robert Meek, and then when I got kicked out of there, went to KCVI and, fini and finished my matriculation there. Yes, we, I had three other brothers. I had uh, a senior brother. He was five years older than me. He was a Bell Telephone employee, but he also enlisted. And he became, uh, he, got a, he got a commission in the engineers. And I had a brother, Don. He was the... He was the one, one I really relied on for important uh, uh, help. He was three years older, a great athlete, could have played professional hockey, but it was told he wasn't mean enough when he was playing hockey and tremendous. But he was, um, he was an, an athlete that uh, he could do anything and play any sport and excel in it. I tried to follow in behind, but uh, wasn't as successful as he was. Anyway, but Brother Don was recruited in the Air Force in, uh, in July of 1939, at the beginning, when they expected the war to begin, and Trenton needed athletes in their inventory, and uh, he was asked to join, but he never passed his medical and he was called back by the CO and uh, passed through the medical, passed the medical officer. He knew him the medical officer anyway, and uh, told he was be court-martialed if he passed him. I don't, 25 years later, he got out of the Air Force, and I don't think he ever passed his medical. He was a tremendous person. He, um, he always kept me out of trouble. And they always said never volunteer. That was his. That was his first statement. He said, "Now you're in the service. I'll look after you in Ottawa, but never volunteer." And that paid off, really. I had great parents, really. Uh, they were very understanding parents. We lived in a neighborhood that uh, working people class. My dad was just a milkman, although he was a journeyman. Uh, plumber, but in the 20s, he, there just wasn't the work for him. And he finally got into a small company, a retail wholesale company, and then a, a dairy. Um, but my father was unusual. He had a, I never found out until he died, really, what he accomplished in his life. He, he had his junior matriculation when his grandfather could neither read nor write. But he had a junior matriculation. He loved poetry, and I do have some of it suddenly talking when I had a tape recorder on. I've got him uh, doing some poetry. And um, he was well respected. When I found out he was past grandmaster of his lodge, and he was also on the Board of Education. These things I didn't know until he died, really. But he, never, he wasn't the type to push what he did in his life. My mother was another person that uh, we had enough, the, the city had an awful lot of respect for her. My mother was an accomplished musician. She was a soprano, trained, well trained. And uh, we found again, my son digging things out of the basement, I found uh, a letter from the Metropolitan Opera Company, con f 
thanking my mother and congratulating my mother on her singing in Aida and Mephistopheles. She belonged to the Queen's University Opera Guild and she was the senior soloist. And, and a couple of weeks ago I found a huge photograph of my mother with her bouquet of roses and all the Queen's University Opera Guild. She must have been the senior soloist. She was tremendous that way. And uh, I, I prized the letter from the Metropolitan Opera Company because uh, he was praising my mother for her singing. I found out she wanted to be sponsored in New York, but by the one of the choir leaders at the church she belonged to. But she said, no, I have two children to look after. They're more important than me going to New York. So that's how it's, that was my mother. Hmm. So she was the senior soloist in the church choir. And these things I'm just finding out. The newspaper, they both died within 20 days of each other, and uh, the newspaper wrote two great uh, stories on both of them, really. So that was my background. What we did on the street, we played on the streets. We played our hockey on the street. We became pretty good at skipping, pretty good at hopscotch, and we had a lot of fun. In fact, the whole neighborhood was uh, great. Now, it was supposed to be on the wrong side of town, but we all had a great time. We never got into trouble. We had a lot of fun on the street and in the, in the small parks, on the railroad tracks, and on the river, the Cataraqui River, which was at our front door. So that was our place to play in the summer and in the winter when it, the, the, when the river froze over. And we played with an awful lot of good hockey players. Some eventually became professional. And certainly we enjoyed uh, our paper route in the area. For instance, down the street, the Cook brothers of the New York Rangers, they, Bill and Bun Cook lived just down the street. And they often talked to my mother and father, but I would see them on the front doorstep, but I wouldn't come out the door. They were famous hockey players, and I was too young to really come out and enjoy what they were talking about. That, that was my neighborhood. And the, the neighborhood produced an awful lot of good people, judges, doctors, and uh, heroes of mine. In fact, Two doors down the street was my great friend Ken Reed. He eventually won the Distinguished Flying Cross in the R RCAF as a navigator. And he was the one that convinced me, never when I never volunteered, he said, you're going to play hockey. I said, Ken, why? He says, you and I are playing on the river and the lakes. Why don't, we, why don't you come up and play for the high school hockey team? Oh, Ken, I don't think I'm good enough. Yes, you are. Well, we won the juvenile championship that, that year, Kingston Collegiate and Vocational Institute. It's closing its doors in a year or so. The neighborhood was fairly steady. Yes, they all, they all seemed to have jobs. My dad worked in a warehouse, but his plumbing, he couldn't do any more plumbing because his stuff wasn't uh, enough work for that. But he was fortunate. These would be probably people who knew him in the lodge. I gathered these are people who had small businesses, were in the same lodge, and therefore come on and work with us. You know that sort of thing. I can remember working it in the wholesale house on Ontario Street. It looked like a Dickens type of thing. You know, a dad sitting in a high stool and keeping the records of uh, shipments of goods and services coming in through that warehouse. And it, it reminded me of some of the, the Dickens stuff, Christmas Carol and all the rest. And only, only the, his boss wasn't a Scrooge. He was always good with me as a kid when I'd come in and had me fake chocolate bars and a good chocolate bar. But they always kept um, a notation of my height every time I came in. My, they, uh, uh, they uh, drew a line on a beam uh, and as I grew up in that place, yeah. 
And then when he left that business, uh, Colonel Fair uh, at Hemlock Dairy, you know, that business closed up. Dad then worked at Hemlock Dairy as the dairyman. Oh, Never okay. went hungry. That's a point that uh, we always remember. My mother was a good cook. And always the Sunday meal was roast beef and, and rice pudding. And we had no car. And uh, plumbing was pretty scarce. I don't think there was any hot water for years in the house. It was, it was uh, heated on the stove. Cause, and, and that stove uh, it was important to me when I was studying at Queen's. I would sit in a chair in front of that stove. After, after I'm skipping along here, after a hockey practice, I would do all my studying, sitting with my feet in the stove oven and under a 60 watt lamp with my books and whatnot. And uh, my father would come down at 3.30 getting ready to go to the dairy and we'd have a coffee together and uh, I'd continue my studies under the lamp. I remember the Rogers Majestic radio that we received. And then with that radio, we glued our ears to that radio, particularly Hockey Night in Canada. We, we with Foster Hewitt, broadcasting the hockey games. Line clears to Gardner. Gardner turns in the corner. Centers out in front of Watson. Watson left right in front of the net fan. Now Meeker gets a chance. He gets another one with hit escape. And his backhand missed the goal as the Leafs wore a rubber in the general direction of Remsick, but their shooting irons are a little off. Keller. Now again, Meeker coming up with Watson. Watson goes over the line. He shoots and scores! Of course, Saturday afternoon was compulsory listening to the opera from New York because it was a sing-along with my mother, with her. She knew every area that... And we, we had to sit around and listen to the opera just the same. The Barber of Seville perhaps would be one of my favorites, yeah. all had to take some musical instrument. That was part of our education at home. It was, it was uh, my brother Jack, the oldest one, took violin and piano and 
my youngest brother, five years younger, he learned uh, clarinet. And my uh, brother Don, of course, escaped a lot to the YMCA, but he learned to play the harmonica, beautiful job on the harmonica. And I had to take, uh, I took guitar lessons and uh, harmonica. So we all had to do some music. So that radio was tremendous. And then later on we got a radio that took a, a record player. And that was even, and then we started, yeah, the original records of Caruso. Oh, I have those records yet. But that was played on a crank uh, machine, you know. They had to crank the thing. But that was uh, well known. Uh, my, my mother used that quite often. The thing I worried about most on the news was the War of the Worlds, I think, if I remember H.G. Wells. That bothered me on the paper route. I said, this is the future. I'm concerned about it. And it did happen. The destruction. They depicted the destruction of cities in war. And that bothered me. Eventually, of course, I got involved with the same thing. But that bothered me. In the meantime, we have a late bulletin from San Diego, California. Professor Endelkoffer, speaking at a dinner of the California Astronomical Society, expressed the opinion that the explosions on Mars are undoubtedly nothing more than severe volcanic disturbances on the surface of the planet. Lots of company, lots of good scene. Oh, yeah, had Big Crosby and some of the others in the comedy shows, yeah. On, t on the radio, yeah. Of course, you had to stand up for God Save the Queen, or King, and the movie houses. Oh, sure, sure. Um, you could see it, see it coming in the newspaper. Of course, I was a paper boy on all these. Uh, of course, I inherited my paper route from my brother Don, who inherited it from my brother Jack and my younger brother, inherited from me in 1942, that sort of thing. That was, the, we, we, we were always part of it, the newspaper business. Because I found out too, my great uncle published a newspaper, the Kinks News, which I didn't know until later. But it all started when I was about a 12 year old, yeah. Uh, it seemed to be a natural thing to do. That's when we had to go down to the newspaper to get our papers to deliver them. And we delivered them all over town. And we owned our own paper too. Read the papers. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Start with the comic, comic section. Always with the comic section. Okay. Sports page would be next after the comic section. Toronto Maple Leafs, of course. Well, in the later times, I, I enjoyed syllabs. I like to watch syllabs. And the, and the Conikers. And all the others, I've, of course, I got to meet some of them anyway. I, I liked uh, Sillaps was a, was one of my favorites, yeah. And some of the Chicago team too, were good players. We had a great newspaper then too. We had good writers and whatnot, and it was a joy to deliver the paper. And that's how I got to know some of the editors and people who worked in the Whig. I, I just didn't deliver the newspapers. Of course, I, I was a part-time photographer too, and that helped out when I was at the WIG, because the circulation manager was a photographer. And Mr. Baines said, you seem to be interested in photography. I'll buy you a camera, and then you can pay me back with your paper of money. So it was a Kodak. 620 camera using 620 film and he showed me how to judge light we didn't have meters in those days how to judge light and how to develop the film and how to do the enlargements so that was my beginning of photography he was tremendous with me and i paid him back from my paper out money the same and that's how I bought my bicycle too, with paper road money. 
and baseball gloves and equipment. Your influence of your parents and your neighbors were, were quite, uh, quite important to us, really. They kept an eye on us. But most of the neighborhood were ex-artillery or ex-World War I people. So they were quite familiar with me. Of course, you had lots of relatives in the area, and that helped out. You know, you knew the sergeant major. You had him as a good customer. He was the sergeant major at RMC, who did everything, taught them everything. And Mr. Coggins, you called him Mr. Coggins. And when he retired, I used to stand in a corner and we talked about military history and all the rest of it. From his standpoint, only Mr. Wash told us about the Boer War and World War I. And there's only some things I remember most about his South Africa experience. But I think the one I remember most, and that, that, that came back to me in World War II, in my event, he used to tell, tell me, Mr. Wash used to tell me, about the friends who lost their lives in the last few days of the war. And that used to bother me. And it's amazing, that's what I thought when I was dangling on my parachute. I said, I remember those stories, but I'm still alive. You know, I'm, I'm still alive. Yet that's one of the things I thought about in the few, few seconds I was in the, in the air. So they were my neighbors on both sides, and there were cousins on, eventually on both sides, and uncles. But I used to stand with my Uncle George. He was badly wounded, but he would not tell me how he got wounded, but I would stand. November the 11th, I always stood with him at the Senate, but he would never tell me World War I. I never noticed that. I, that. That's a question that uh, bothers me too. I never ran into it that I can think of, of anybody. And I've run into them with, who had extreme experiences, but it didn't seem to affect them. As far as I know, I don't know what the home life was like maybe. I had no idea. I had won a trip getting new customers to a trip to Toronto. And we were putting out an extradition. And I grabbed those extraditions and went outside the Week Standard office on King Street. And I I think I made 35 bucks to take me to Toronto. <laughs> I don't, I don't really remember my thoughts on that. Really, I don't. It's strange, isn't it? I know my mother was worried. My father said nothing. My mother was a peacenik. But we all had, there's one thing of my, my mother, we had to respect our teachers, our neighbors, our police, and our military. I, 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 I really respected the military because they were good neighbors. The trip to Toronto, I remember, Mr. Baines took us, and I saw my first television in 1939. Amazing. It's because he appeared on that screen. That's the first time I saw television. My paper route was so interesting. I had so many interesting people that I really enjoyed doing it. That was, uh, I wasn't too bright in school, high school. I was in public school. And I got the certificates to prove it, that I had good success. I was unhappy in high school in the sense that I didn't feel that teachers 
pressed enough on me on certain subjects like writing and and uh, arithmetic and all the rest. I was a, pretty much of a failure in algebra. And the teacher told me I was a failure, that I wasn't too bright. The math teacher. What's uh, when your teachers knew all your families? Don't forget, in your public school days, your teachers knew your families and grandparents and aunts and uncles and everything else. And they also probably taught you in Sunday school too. You couldn't avoid them. I was uh, christened as a Methodist, and that became the United Church. So that was about it. And uh, my mother was heavily involved in the choir, as was my grandfather. She never encouraged uh, us to be involved, but she had no other choice, really. She certainly wasn't a, a, a flag waver or anything like that. Yet, we had to, we were always taken to parades at RMC mm -hmm. and November the 11th, sir, because we had to. And that's where I got my interest in band music. When she was interested in opera, I would be conducting the Royal Marines Band on, on my father's uh, t toolbox and she would be listening to the radio and I'd be listening to my band music. And that would be, I might have been 12 or 13 or 14. Uh, she understood that and encouraged it and I had quite a collection, I still have, mm. of some of the original. Some my age and others uh, earlier uh, who had military families and they certainly did, the sons, yeah. A cousin next door in the Navy, Bill. He was a Dems uh, gunner in a merchant ship in the North Atlantic but a terrible storm and he drowned. That's the first one, yeah. The next one was down the street. Cousin Elmer died in Sicily, in Italy. I didn't know that till later. But he died of fatigue too much in Italy. And another one I didn't know till later. His picture's in the books here. He bailed it too low, 700 feet over Belgium and he lost his life. So they're the ones of the family stuff. I knew, I certainly later, well, of the junior football team, we were a championship football team at KCBI. I know a couple of my favorites, George Kinnear, who was, I was to take over his job next year playing football as the kicker and the, on the team, but he died over Berlin as a bomb ever. Doug Hackett, the, Doug Hackett, uh, the chief's, uh, Bill Hackett, the chief, uh, former, uh, the, just retired, Chief Hackett, his son, his brother, Doug, died in, uh, over Berlin as a, a decorated DFC type, a bomb ever. So they were in the neighborhood who died. I never thought it would happen, and that's normal. But particularly during the Air Force days, it, it won't happen to me. That was seen to be the attitude, really. It's important to me because uh, on the night we were in into trouble, I knew I knew we were going to run into trouble. I knew what was going to happen because I went in to see the Padre, I think you've read that. I did go in to see the Padre and he said, do you need a, a prayer? And I said, no, I just want to sit. It's going to be an interesting evening, but it's not going to be fatal. But I told the crew, 
And they said, oh, not again. I had done this before with them, and it happened. And then I went to tell my friend Len Berger, I said, Len, we're going to have an interesting night, but it's not going to be fatal. And I left it at that. I didn't tell him I wouldn't be back. But he, uh, the, the Padre said to me, do you think you need prayer? I said, no, I, it's just going to be an interesting evening. But I did see the Padre at the end of the runway that night give me the thumbs up. Isn't it? It's amazing, all well, the hundred people who went along in the runway, I saw him. Now that's, that's, uh, I never felt fatalistic, no. So some of them did, some did, and it did happen. I've talked to others about it. It's interesting in the sense that it, how your feelings go. I got to uh, give that paper it up to my brother, but there were a whole bunch of us in that mailing room and the in the taking paper. We went in a, what we call a pit, and there was a senior line and a junior line. And I'm I'm thinking, geez, three of those guys all ended up in the Air Force. One ended. He, we were all about nineteen and twenty, but they all ended up flight lieutenants and flying officers, and and all successful. Again, I wasn't going to volunteer, but they they sent me the letter, and that's when the decision was made by the the circulation manager, who had now joined the Air Force as a sergeant photographer. That's when he decided. Look at you've got your notice. Join us in Ottawa. We have a great department. And since my math teacher and brother Jack said I was the stupid one in the family, I said, well, I'll be a photographer. And I went to Ottawa. First time I'd ever ridden on a train to Ottawa. And uh, I was registered, but somebody with lots of stripes on their sleeve, well, in fact a couple of them, medical officer, it must have been a wing commander or squadron leader or somebody like that, I wondered what I did wrong. And they called me in they said, do you realize you're qualified for air crew? I said, no, I didn't think I was, because I was the stupid one of the family. <laughs> And uh, they said, yes, you're qualified. So, well, I was flattered. I said, okay, sure, why not? Have a go at it. My mother wouldn't say anything, my father wouldn't say anything. No, they wouldn't. So That's the nature of my family. I went to school in Ottawa. I remember going back to high school when my math teacher said I was the and algebra tapped me on the shoulder. Why aren't you as smart, smart as your brothers in math? And then the second year on the algebra, I'm still no good. He said, now look at Stuart, here are my instructions on, on the exam. I want you all to have a good rest the night before the exam. And then he tapped me on the shoulder and said, Stuart, you go for a long walk on the day of the exam, <laughs> so I wouldn't show up. Sammy Hitzman was his name. He was a friend of the family. We used to go to his summer cottage and whatnot. But eventually they changed the teachers. Mr. Troll was one of them. And they opened the door for me in math, the two of them. I was forever grateful to them because we had to have the crews had air crew in the front end, wireless operators, bomb pilots, and 
had to have matriculation. As you know, we had to have junior matriculation. So that's how I ended up teaching elder in Ottawa. I've been okay for air crew. I helped the other guys get their matriculation so they could qualify for air crew. It turned out quite well. Then they ship a, off to Manning Depot, Montreal, Lachine. Thousands of us. Christmas time, I can remember they telling us not to go home. I just ignored it. I went home. Stood on the train all the way. I had a good Christmas. Then after that, I only miss one Christmas at home. Anyway, after that, you uh, they put you on a train in the middle of winter and head out for Man Manitoba to a, just a holding unit, Suras, Manitoba. It was an airfield that wasn't being used for flying. And all they did was parade each day and play hockey at night in a barn board rink, freeze to death, good, ac good accommodations, good meal. Had a pretty good corporal sergeant. So that's what happened out in, one of, out in Suris, Manitoba. We had a great time. I played hockey with them. We had a great time. Uh, we, our barrack block was a great one. We used to all sit on our bunks and watch the sunsets out in the prairies. Oh, we had a good time. We had ice cream. We're crazy. 40 below zero, play hockey. Puck would hit a post and shatter in four pieces because it was so damn cold. But there was just a parade. We were on a parade ground. And we prayed it in a hangar all the time. We had a great little corporal. He was a little guy. And he was okay. He was fun. And uh, I know he used to wake me up and when he came home from the pub and, Stuart, Stuart, I need some help. So I had to put him to bed and make sure he was comfortable. As opposed to that other corporal. In, but that's another story. My brother Don did never volunteer. So when the parade square, they were asking for volunteers for Vancouver, Victoria, all on the west and the east coast. And again, I don't say anything and keep still. I'm about the only one on the parade square left standing, and I get posted to Trenton. Trenton, home free. <laughs> And that's in about March of 1943, and that's where I had my first uh, flight. The flight lieutenant said, would you like to come with me? A beautiful day. Clouds, beautiful. We went up to Peterborough and back, and by the time I got down the ground, I must have been green. He said, would you like to go up again? I think he knew what the answer would be. I said, no, thank you, sir. But I said, this is ridiculous. Am I in for this? Am I going to suffer like this for the rest of my days? It was terrible. And then Trenton, I became a firefighter. I could be the only one that would fit in an asbestos suit, but I never had to rescue anybody. Learned how to drive a tractor and a hammer hangar. And that was a great visit, really. We had a good time in Trent. Then from there you get posted to uh, initial training school. Kept my mouth shut again. Ended up in Belleville <laughs> at the, uh, what they call the Deaf and Dumb School. School for the Deaf. That was a tough school. That, that was the beginning of the tremendous training we got. The ITS was, you worked from what, 6.30 in the morning till about midnight, learning all phases of aviation, link trainer, how to pull guns apart, navigation, all, all the slamp. And that's when they did the great job, I thought. ITS was tremendous in picking out the personalities 
and the various air crews, bomb aimers, navigators. Of course you had a group that always thought they'd like to be pilots. I never thought that at all. I'll go where they think I'm suited. So I kept my mouth shut and learned a hell of a lot. And I was chosen as a bomb aimer. And we were versatile. We were a sort of an all-purpose person. Different personalities, maybe. We all seem to have the same personality. And uh, that's how I ended up as a bomb member. And, uh, and I was second pilot, of course. Bomb members seemed to end up as second pilot. I took a lot of link trainer, as you know, the little thing on the pedestal. I took a lot of link trainer. I must have failed it as a pilot, but came close, so there would be a bomb aimer. And I think I think it was the right move. I didn't worry about it. I got into trouble in in, in Belleville. I didn't like a particular corporal. I aggravated him to no end because I didn't like him. And my kindly sergeant, he must have been an old World War I type, a great guy. I, I thought he was trying, I'd do anything for him. He called me into his office and said, Stuart, what's this? You're getting into trouble with that corporal. I said, I hate the son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> he said, look it, that's not your nature. I said, no, I'm, I'm quite happy. He said, look it. Get the lawn more out, and you cut the lawn around the administration building for three nights. But make sure you're seen cutting that lawn. The kindly sergeant, I, I'd do anything for him, you know that sort of thing, and that's what I did. Every time I look at that building, I know I cut that lawn three for three nights in a row when I go by it all the time. So that was my corporal. That's. Uh, when I graduated from the ITS, then the next phase is your bombing and gunnery school. And that was in Fingal, Western Ontario. A great school, but I ran into trouble there too. Physical trouble. Because uh, the pressure was so great in initial training school, going to a flying school was a relaxation. And a lot of us played a lot of the sports and went swimming. Ernie Dickens, who had just come back from the Toronto Maple Leafs, he got me playing soccer together with him. And I just slept too much in an open window and got Bill's palsy on the side of my face. And he ended up in the hospital at the same time. We weren't sick, but we were just under treatment. Three, three weeks in the hospital. I missed a lot of classes, so I got turned back into another course. And But Ernie and I ran into trouble in the hospital because we were reasonably healthy. So we would have uh, wheelchair races down the corner. But that ended uh, one day when uh, those corridors were pretty narrow. When we cleaned out a corporal nurse on the corner, and that ended the wheelchair races in the hospital. I'm glad we didn't hit the, uh, we hit a corporal nurse, but I'm glad we didn't hit Mary Elizabeth Caldwell, the prettiest nurse in the whole hospital. I would hate to have run into her, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> so, so you spent three weeks in the hospital and then you lose you had to go back to another course. And maybe that saved my life. Who knows where I would have been. Maybe, maybe. The delay in getting graduation from bombing and gunnery. In the wintertime, colder than Billy be damned. Navigate, uh, learning how to do things in an Anson aircraft. In the middle of winter, it's no fun. But I got to know every crossroads and Western Ontario. And then you finish your bombing and gunnery school 
and you didn't shoot down any uh, Lysander aircraft for towing a tug. It's a wonder they didn't get shot down. And uh, that's where it's your air to air firing. And you dropped some little bombs on targets. And then you're off to a navigation school. And again, that's the versatility of the bomb aimer. You had to go to a navigation school where gunners didn't go. The gunners just ended up on aircraft from their, bomb, from their gunnery school and they suffered a hell of a lot. Anyway, off to bombing and gunnery school and that was a tough, tough, in London, Ontario, that was a tough month. I can remember that, how tired I was. It's a new world on navigation. But I must have done very well. I remember the last day, last night, the bombing and the gunnery, the navigation leader said, uh, will you stay in the mess tonight? I may need you for another course. I had already three course, three day, three trips of two hours each. So I went to the mess and he said, I, there are beautiful leather chairs in front of the fireplace and all I remember I was waking up about seven o'clock in the morning. I said, oh, oh, I'll be failed. So I went to the navigation leader. I said, I'm sorry, sir. He said, never mind. I don't need you anymore. I, I checked on you in the mess. You were sound asleep and I didn't want to bother you. You've passed your course. So that's how I ended up f finishing in, in Tremlin. And then on uh, wing sprayed, I got my wing. And uh, sergeant's rank for a day, and I got my commission. And that's, and I look at the list of the people, more, a lot of us ended up on the same squadron. And a lot of them remained friends. Uh, but the lousy weather, we, we had good pilots and never, never any accidents. So I know I talked to a friend who was in a, they ended up, a, a poor weather report, they ended up on a snow, snow, snowstorm. They all had to bail out, yeah. Yeah, leave time at home. Again, I never met, never missed Christmas and all these dues. Amazing. Yeah, we, I went home, had a couple of weeks at home, the pictures of, then I found out my brother called me the stupid one. He got his commission in the engineers in Brockville, but I got ahead of him, so that out, I outranked him. I had seniority for once in my life over my big brother. <laughs> anyway, yeah, we had a good time at home and and then we went off to Maitland, Nova Scotia. That was another holding unit, and that was a survival school, a battle school. And that's where we did a lot of uh, army stuff. You know, wading out to the Bay of Fundy up ladders with the army guys firing live ammunition at you. And they didn't miss too many or didn't hit too many. And we'd over barricades. So I, I took the camera with me one day to do it, to record it all. So I wasn't fibbing on this one. I've got the kick pictures to prove it. We dug through ditches. We had people firing at us from trees and ambush. And I don't know why we didn't. We could have, go we could have gone into the infantry. I think I fired every piece of artillery they ever had down there, Sten guns and others. And they had people up in trees firing in. We had to locate them. We went through ditches of mud and water, 10 mile route marches, run the, run the last mile, and go over these barricades. It was tough, but it got us in shape. 
and we enjoy, all enjoyed it all. We made we made fun out of it. Well, sure, we had water battles in the barracks at night sometimes, and flood the flood the barracks, you know that sort of thing. But it was part of the relief of uh, pressure. And then off they sent to Britain, and I went on the uh, Ile de France out of New York, and ended up in Greenock, and it was quiet, quiet like going to Wolf Island. Um, the lining up to get into the food was t twice, a, twice, a, twice a day, you only ate twice a day. To about, I'd say about 12,000 on the ship. My brothers went over, my brother Don went over on the Queen Elizabeth at the time. Well, he went over, of course he went over early. Anyway, um, we came back uh, differently to Halifax, yeah. And that was a, another story, really. But going to, when we landed up in Britain, we ended up in Innsworth and Gloucester. And that was another holding unit. From there on, we were, we had a pretty easy time, easy time of it. And Innsworth and Gloucestershire, and a holding unit. It was there that I got to meet a lot of friends and Again, we weren't pub crawlers. We just enjoyed uh, going around, finding places to eat. And one one fellow, Fee Van, and we, well, that's that's where I saw the uh, assembly at night, 11, 11 o'clock at night. We watched the assembly of the aircraft uh, heading for Normandy. We didn't know it was D-Day. It was the gathering of the paratroopers and gliders. We counted about 450 aircraft overhead, about 11.15 to 11.30 at night. We knew something was up, but we didn't know until the next day, until we read it in the newspapers. And that young fellow, I, the fellow I was with, uh, he was a gambler. He could hear dice a, a mile away. He never drank, he never smoked, he never, he never swore. Beautiful dancer. But he asked me to stay with him for a month, every day, every night. He had his bunk next to me, and I followed him wherever he went. It was a great experience. But on that night, I lost him. I said, I've lost him. That was about the. 29th day of the month. He wanted me to with him for a month. I went looking for him in the barrack blocks, one o'clock in the morning. I saw a slit in the curtains. I said, that's where he might be. I walked into the barrack blocks. I saw him, but he, he, he absolutely ignored me. He went, his eyes went through me. He was busy at the table gambling with the dice. Three o'clock in the morning, I hear the voice. He was shaking my bunk. Stuart, wake up. God, we counted a total of about 1,700 pounds in currency, British currency, which amounted about 3,000 bucks at the time. He'd won it all. We were counting it all on my bed, on my bunk. Now we have to get rid of it. And you know, you weren't supposed to bank any more than your normal salary. So we had to go to various banks across England. We started in London. There were a couple of banks there, depositing, having a deposit account. The last one was up in Edinburgh in Scotland, uh, the bank manager, typical Scottish bank manager, you know, beautiful office with paneled walls, walnut probably, or oak or whatever, very strict. Sir, you're depositing some money here today. I said, yes. Where did it come from? Well, I had a quick thinking our parents sent us some money. 
so we could have it to spend. So I, I don't know whether we got away with it, but we did. No. A year later, I'm on the boat home. And it's a brand new Dutch Amer North um, um, Holland America line. It's a beautiful boat. I'm I'm in a, a room with about four people, paneled walls, beautiful food. Half of Kingston's on that boat, including my cousins and friends and artillery and ordnance corps. And it's a beautiful crossing. And there's my friend, the gambler, Phoebe. I said, Phoebe, what about the money? How much have you got left? He said, 50 bucks. <laughs> 50 bucks. You know, that sort of thing. That was a great trip home. Anyway, that's, these are little stories that go along yeah. when you're in a, a holding unit and then first thing you know you're sent to Scotland in July, I think it is, according to my book, is you have to take a familiarization course and it's entirely different than flying in Western Ontario. The confusion of railroads and and roads in Britain, particularly in Sc and in Scotland, we're in a place called Wigtown in the summertime. Again, the same old gang that we graduated with. So we just get on the bus on weekends and go up to Scotland, uh, Air in Scotland, and. They had a great beach there, and I was skating at a big and a beautiful rink, and and that's how we spent our weekends. But it was intense of flying for a month, map reading mainly, for two hours at a time, just to uh, just to get acclimatized to the weather and the roads and map reading. That's all we did. You finish that, and then you get posted to an operational training unit. That's where the crewing starts. In that case, I ended up in Stratford at number 22 OTU in the summertime. And that's when they put you in a barn or a hangar and somebody comes along and says, uh, would you fly with me? And I happen to be a pilot. Would you fly with me? He looked like a good type. It ended up Freddie Hatch, one of the great Hatch families of Toronto. Freddie, he says, I've got a couple of, I've got a navigator. Picked and how would you like to be my bomb ever? And, you know, and he goes around and picks up a couple of gunners and a wireless operator, and that's how it happened. Purely chance, pure chance. The next stage is, uh, you start flying, and you have a, a sequence. You have a, a segment of daylight trips and night trips, a certain number of hours. I'm learning how to basic navigation, but basically dropping gun bombs, and that happened to be in Sherwood Forest. And a bit of gunnery, not much, but basic navigation, basic navigation. A lot of work, a lot of work. And uh, I used to help the pilot because Freddie didn't uh, weigh too much and he was having difficult with a Wellington, we were flying the two engine Wellington aircraft. And that particular runway in Stratford had a bit of a gully before you, and he had a trouble with a heavy aircraft, and he only weighed about 139 pounds. I used to call up the airspeeds and keep an eye on him, and call out the airspeeds. And but he came into the mess. He was in the mess one day, and he said, uh, "I'm washing myself out." I said, Fred, you're having trouble with, 
the landing. You see, I don't want to kill you guys. I admired him for it. I did. I still do. Admire him for it. I said, you're having difficulty with the landings, yeah. Sure. And now we've got another problem. We now have night segments, segment of light, night navigation, bombing, gun. And we pick up a, I don't know, he was sergeant pilot, filling up. He must have been discarded somewhere else. He flew a great straight and level flight, so he had no problem navigation and dropping bombs. And although I, I could have given him hell for one night. We, we were up in the north of Wales, and we ran through a snowstorm, and I had to shovel the snow out of the front bumping compartment and push the snow down the flare chute. He was too low because I could see the light on the top of Mount Snowden. And I had him get out of there. But he had one night during the last night of our trainings schedule with a terrible wind, 70 mile an hour wind. And I told the, some of the crew that I was with close to, I said, I think we'd better sit in the crash position tonight. This, this pilot's going to have trouble. And it did. 70 mile an hour gale force winds. I think I knocked the lights out of the target so it was good straight and level. But he dropped that Wellington about 50 feet above the deck. And all I can remember, I'm sitting, I told the and the nearest guys to sit in the crash position. I said, we're going to have trouble with him tonight. They didn't believe me, but they did. The fire engine was coming down the runway after The ambulance was coming down the runway after us. And the flight lieutenant, who was on duty that night, he was coming down in a car. And when we finished, we must have tipped both wings on the runway. And the poor flight lieutenant, he was upset. He opened the door and, is everybody all right here? I said, yep, we're okay. We never saw him again, that pilot. Now that throws us up. This comes back to my brother Don, who joined the Air Force early. Never volunteer, Don. It, it, my life involved is, is I'm here because of him. That's another story, well, I'll tell you. He seemed to always show up where I was stationed or on leave. I don't know how he did it, but he worked in Air Force headquarters in London, England. He a sergeant. Recommended by the RAF or commissioned by the RCF, wouldn't, wouldn't commission him. He was too valuable as an NCO. Well, he used to show up. Well, when they set up six group, that is the group was separate from the RAF, 14 squadrons. I think you may know the story in Yorkshire. But he's the one, he's the one that has set up all the orderly rooms and the routines that the, the staff had to use which gets me back to that final day when we were sent up to Yorkshire in the middle of winter because of the lousy pilot we had. And I was met by a flight lieutenant, the adjutant of the station in Dalton, Yorkshire, and an army major. That was a survival school and I, I had my school in in Canada. And the flight lieutenant said, uh, we're going to ask you, do you know a Sergeant Don Crawford? Well, I wondered what the hell they had on this guy. So I kept my mouth shut. I said I didn't know him. 
Oh, so next day in the mess, they said, we're going to ask you that question again. Did you know Sergeant John Crawford? I said, what do you got on this guy? Oh, we think you're his brother. Well, I had to confess. He, yes, he was my brother. And so I said, what do you got in this guy? He said, we're here. We're here because of your brother. He, tra he trained us in the orderly room routine. And the sergeant said, we never went to the CO. We went to your brother to get the answers, any answers. Now what can we do for you? Which was unusual. You pick the pilot. That was unusual. You pick the pilot. Well, the navigator and I interviewed for a whole week or more of the young pilots, you know, the 20-year-olds and 22-year-olds. And this one guy kept coming back in his jungle uniform, in his Middle East uniform, brown uniform. He just finished his tour on Liberators. And he kept bugging us. And we kept, we kept a calm, you know, pros and cons against each individual pilot. Well, these young kids, they wouldn't know what flak looked like, so they wouldn't know this, that. This guy, he's flown every aircraft, Hamden's over the Ruhr, Wellington's, he's flown Sterling's, he's flown G-24's. Maybe we better pick him. He's, he spent, he could have gone home. He'd finished his tour. He'd had 36 trips, 37 trips there. He could have gone home. But this guy kept bugging us. So finally we picked the old guy. We figured, well, he may save our lives. He may, he'll be the one to understand what flak looks like, what danger looks like. So we did. We picked the old guy of 25 with all the experience. And that was Hugh Cram. And that was Hugh. And I apologized to him. I said, Hugh, after he picked, we picked him, I said, I'm sorry we made you wait for so long, week and a half. He said, the longer you waited, the longer I wanted you as a crew. And I've been checking your records. <laughs> so that's how we ended up, because of my brother, that's how I ended up with the best pilot in the country. He wanted to keep flying. Simple. He was a nut that way. Amazing. Amazing. He was the one. Uh, we only had two, oh, two ops with him, but uh, I knew we had a winner. Now you go to a, a conversion unit where you convert from Wellingtons to the four engines. And that's when we converted to the Lancaster. And um, I'm still the second pilot. We don't have a flight engineer yet. I started doing, as I did with Freddie Hatch, calling out air speeds and landing and take off circuits and pumps in the Lancaster. And I knew we had a winner when uh, Hugh Cram said, I don't need you. I said, boy, oh no, I know we've got a winner. He's doing it all himself. And that's when I knew we had a winner. Beautiful, beautiful pilot, straight and level landing, takeoff, great. The person we pick up and halfway through that is a flight engineer. He's an Englishman. And he has a full wing. I said, okay, we've got another pilot. That gets me off the hook. <laughs> so that's how it ended up with the seventh man on the crew, flight engineer. He was a little sloppy at first. He kept knocking off switches and whatnot because there's only that much space. But he ended up as a great flight engineer. Yeah, it ended up perfect. That's how it is.